Okay, hello everyone. Um, well, I wanted to announce Legal Studies program is having a law panel, but I forgot to write down the details. Maybe I'll just forward the email to you guys. Um, and also, I got another uh, kind of announcement to pass on if you don't know about it, that um, people who uh, need help with equipment to connect to the internet. Now, I guess, I mean, people who are actually here probably don't need help because you're connected, obviously, <laughs> but um, that, the you know, UCSC has some programs uh, you can, they have a laptop lending program and a bunch of other stuff. Um, maybe I should just forward that email too. Well, I hate to spam you with a lot of announcements, but I guess it's better than me vaguely <laughs> rambling on here. All right, anyway, um, I, so I decided, I think I actually really, even though it was kind of rushed, I think I said what I needed to say about paternal authority last time, unless, are there questions about that? Okay. Is it, some of it will come up again, uh, but... Um, yeah, so I'm just going to go on and start discussing the reading for this time. And um, so the first thing to talk about is um, what Locke says about marriage in the beginning of chapter 7. Um, so this is something actually that Hobbes doesn't really address. Um in a sense, Hobbes couldn't address it because, according to Hobbes, uh, in there there can't be marriage in a state of nature, because uh, according to Hobbes, there can't be compacts in a state. Well, I mean, there can, but you uh, there's no reason to keep them <laughs> in a state of nature. So, uh, therefore, people presumably aren't going to make them either. Um, so, uh, so Hobbes thinks that marriage as such can only exist under civil law, um, as opposed to Locke, who says right out, uh, section seven, chapter seven, section 77, that, uh, the first society was between man and wife. So, um... When I say Hobbes can't discuss it, I mean, for Hobbes, the family is only going to be a unit if one person has dominion in it. And remember, he, he's, he doesn't give really any explanation why, uh, well, I mean, first of all, he doesn't really give, Hobbes doesn't really give a good explanation why uh, it would be the father who would come to have dominion over the children rather than the mother. On the contrary, he says that, you know, normally it would be the mother. That's what Hobbes says. So, uh, but then there's that unexplained transition where he says, oh, but fathers formed commonwealths. And that's why the uh, right went to the father but he doesn't explain why it was fathers who formed commonwealths. Um, but, I mean, uh, even less than he explains d dominion of the father over the children, does Hobbes explain why there would be any dominion of the father over the mother? It doesn't seem like there's any reason for that in the state of nature. I mean, unless... Uh, unless he was able to conquer her and, you know, um, 
spare her life and make her his servant, <laughs> right? Uh, but other than just the fact that that they have the same children gives no uh, reason for dominion, according to Hobbes. So when he says, you know, when he talks about families in a state of nature, it's not clear whether uh, there are normally or ever two parents involved in those families, according to Hobbes. Um, of course, again, as usual, Locke isn't arguing with Hobbes, he's operating, arguing with Filmer. <laughs> So according to Filmer, of course, Adam was given dominion over both uh, his children and Eve. Um, so, uh, um, but Locke says, I don't see where you get that either from reason or from the Bible. Um, so anyway, I mean, that's, so I guess that's... That introduction is about saying that um, Locke is um, trying to explain something that Hobbes doesn't explain at all and that Filmer has a bad explanation for. Namely, number one, why uh, um, we usually see both parents involved in the family and he's also trying to explain what's true almost everywhere he knows of not everywhere but almost everywhere he knows of that um the father is in charge of the family so he's trying to give an explanation for that but he's trying to give an explanation that doesn't support filmer So um, so this is what he says about marriage. So he says, I mean, first of all, it's a compact. Now, um, I'm not sure if Locke always uses compact in Hobbes' technical sense, right? That it's a contract where the rights are transferred right away, but the goods may be delivered later. Um, um, But uh, we can try to figure out whether it's a compact in that sense by asking what rights are supposed to be exchanged. So, um, so there's really, you know, there's two things here. One of them, I don't exactly know how to gloss this over. Um, and this is the same thing that, that Kant, uh, I guess, has become kind of infamous for saying, but Locke says it too that it, it's a contract for the use of one another's genital, genitals. <laughs> I guess uh, Locke isn't quite as graphic as Kant about that. He says something like the use of one another's body for the, for the purpose of procreation. So, right, it's a compact. One, it's, a, it's, it's, it's about sex, right? <laughs> It's it's a contract to have sex with each other in order to have children. And number two, so so in a sense, uh, I think I guess Locke thinks this is the primary purpose, but then um, secondarily, because the purpose of reproduction is not just to produce children, but to continue the species, Locke says. So. Therefore, uh, they also, um, in like engaging with one another to to uh, perform procreation, are also uh, at least tacitly agreeing to um, help each other support the children. Which, since human children need a lot of support, uh, turns out actually to be a much bigger deal than the so-called primary purpose. Um, so apparently, I guess if I would ask which, if, if, whether this is a compact in the technical sense, 
So this definitely is, right? In other words, if at the time they get married or agree to become a couple, however this works in the state of nature, right? Uh, at the time they reach that agreement, there aren't even any children yet. So uh, all the goods are being delivered in the future. Um, and over a period of many years. This is less clear why there sh why there's any reason it should be uh, um, have reference to the future at all, right? So, um, and I don't know if it's worth spending a lot of time on this, but it's interesting because I because I. Well, it's interesting to try to understand what Locke would say about this. Um, so, I mean, because what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is that um, every time they have sex, it requires new consent, which is what we would now say, right? So, um, so the question is, you know, does Locke for some reason think that that won't work? Um, or that that's um, either that it won't work or that it's not necessary? Um, what was I going to read here? Oh, section 79. Um, so there's this little bit of like uh, sociobiology here which is not very accurate. I mean, there's a lot of cases that go against the, the generalizations he's making. Um, right, like, I mean, cat, cats besides lions, the, you know, they're beasts of prey and the, the young have to be taught how to Pray and they have to be supported until they can do that, but generally the father's not involved in raising them. So, like, he can't explain that case. But anyway, what he says here is, um, in those viviparous animals which feed on grass, the conjunction between male and female lasts no longer than the very act of copulation. Right? I mean, there's counterexamples to this too, like in the other direction. Horses, you know, usually travel in herds and the, both parents are there. Elephants, well, they don't feed on grass, they feed on trees, whatever. Um, so the rule he's, he's giving is just not true, but I'm interested in the fact that... Um, He's, that that in the way he understands it, in a case where the secondary purpose doesn't apply, um, there is no reason for continued association. So presumably the same thing would be true for humans too, if it weren't for this secondary purpose. Um, that's what he seems to be saying there. Again, as biology, it's not uh, convincing, but as um, but it gives some insight maybe into what he thinks this agreement is like. Um, it it really seems like whether he does or not that he should say, you know, um, this part is is just like limited to on the spot. There isn't an agreement in the future for the use of one another's genitals. Um, uh, at, at least in a state of nature, right? Maybe it might, could, might be different due to positive laws in a commonwealth. Okay, so anyway, so far so good as far as that goes. But then the question is, so, so far this doesn't involve any kind of dominion. Right? I mean, this is just an agreement between two people. And um, um, it doesn't give either of them any control over the other, you know, beyond the, you know, ability to enforce the agreement under the law of nature. Um, so, uh, 
the question is where do we get that where do we get anything like one parent being in charge of the other parent um so Locke's explanation is um this is in chapter 7 section 82 Um, but the husband and wife, though they have but one common concern, yet having different understandings, will unavoidably sometimes have different wills too. It therefore being necessary that the last determination, that is, the rule, should be placed somewhere, it naturally falls to the man's share as the abler and the stronger. So, um, um, so first of all, again, it seems to have nothing to do with the primary purpose. It has everything to do with the secondary purpose, according to Locke. This is the only place where anything like dominion comes from here, and it's because um, they have to do this thing together. They've agreed to do this thing together. And so in cases where they disagree, someone must have the final say. Now, I mean, I would say that's not obvious at all. Um, especially, you know, when there's only two people, right? So like, I mean, if, we, if, if two people make an agreement to be partners in a business or something, they don't have to make, give one of them the final say. What happens if they disagree? Well, they try to work it out, you know, but until they both agree, they can't do anything. Um, yes, Griffin. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so at the end of that paragraph, it, uh, it goes on to say, um, whether that contract be made by themselves in the state of nature or by the customs of laws, of the country they live in, and the children upon such separation fall to the father or mother's lot, such as the contract does determine. So that means, like, if the parents separate, yeah, the dominion goes to one of the parents, which the contract that they entered into by marriage determines. Right. It means, yeah, so it means in the state of nature, uh, they um should provide explicitly for what's going to happen in that case otherwise i'm not sure how it's going to be decided um but if it says that they decide then why is it that the man naturally has dominion well the, so this doesn't mean that the man has dominion and so i mean this this doesn't mean that the man has dominion over the children and the mother doesn't it means, so, I mean, it's actually, like, I think um, Locke, whether because this is the direction he really wants to move, I probably is, based on what little I know about what Locke might think, but, but or if it's just because he's he wants to beat Filmer down as much as possible, he really limits what this quote-unquote dominion is as much as possible, right? So it turns out that um, this th it isn't really dominion, right? All it is is like, you know, being able to cast the tie vote when they disagree with each other about the care of the children, Right, so I mean, he goes out of his way to emphasize that it gives the it it gives the uh, father no other right to command the mother, as right as opposed to Filmer, who was who's, who will say that the you know the father, like Adam, has absolute power over the rest of the family, including um, the mother of the children. Uh, Locke is saying, um, which again, at least in the state of nature, Hobbes would agree with, uh, 
Well, no, I mean, I guess, okay. In the state of nature, Hobbes would say, not only is there no dominion, and there's no arrangement at all between them, <laughs> right? So Locke is saying, no, in the state of nature, there is a certain kind of arrangement between them. And, um, and that turns out to be important because he says that even after the formation of the Commonwealth, they, they can only be regulated, um, you know, like it's still the same arrangement and the Commonwealth can only butt in for a good reason, basically. Right. So, um, but anyway, yeah, so there is an arrangement between them in the, in the state of nature. It does involve, um, having to decide that one of them is the first parent and the other one is the second parent, so to speak. It doesn't have to be the man. Um, but Locke wants to explain why it usually ends up being the man as far as he can tell. So remember, Hobbes just records that fact and doesn't explain it. Locke's explanation is not great, um, but, uh, um, but he just says it's natural. And I think here by natural, he doesn't mean it's part of the law of nature or anything like that. He just means it's like kind of easier or something like that. Right, it's like the natural way to decide it is, well, one of the parents is stronger than the other on average, so that one will probably be the one. That's kind of like, why is that what's relevant? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, because if you imagine that they're kind of arm wrestling for this, then they're already in trouble, I think. <laughs> right? So, um, but again, I, you know, I think like to uh, cut lock, lock some slack here, again, that's why I started by, by emphasizing what the situation is that he's responding to. You know, he just... He wants to explain why, again, I, this is like the third time I said this, but he wants to explain why in general you find fathers heading families, but he wants to explain that in a way that doesn't make the father any kind of political um, or despotical ruler over anyone, right? So, um, so I don't know if I addressed the question you were asking, Griffin, though. I'm not sure what the question... Uh, I think you addressed it pretty well. Okay. I was, the way that uh, I was reading um, the end of, 80, of paragraph 82 yeah. was that the so the father, gen, or I think Locke says generally the father is the head of the family because on average he's stronger. But when a when it's a decision, I guess it, it says like at the end um, – that the wife, in many cases, a liberty to separate from him, where natural right or their contract allows it, whether that contract be made by themselves in the state of nature or by the customs or laws of the country they live in, the children upon such separation fall to the father or the mother's lot, as such contract is determined. So, in the natural, it's in the, in the natural state, and in, in the law, in the state of nature, generally the father is in charge. But once they separate, it's based on a contractual situation who is in charge who is in charge of the children right i mean like the other one is basically a contractual situation too i think in right. other words if yeah. i think in the state of nature if when they get together you know either because in this case the father's not the stronger or because they don't these this particular couple don't feel that's relevant, you know, they could arrange for the mother to be the head of the family and and lock you know sometimes going forward will go out of his way to say, or the mistress of the family, if there's a mistress instead of a master, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think there is something of a question here, like why... I think he doesn't feel that it's important to explain how that usually happens. First of all, because there isn't as much uniformity, right? Like often the children do go with the mother, but sometimes they go with the father. It depends what country, it depends on the case, whatever. Um, so, uh, but, and also because like there's, you know, there's, there's nothing there for Filmer to do anything with. <laughs> so he's not as interested in explaining, you know, but presumably in this case too, if there's no contract, 
something is going to have to decide it, and I don't know what in state of nature. Um, I mean, you know, if this happens often, it will be important for something to decide, decide it because um, you don't want a situation where they each say, it's not my problem. <laughs> that would be what you would worry about here, I think, more than they each wanting to do it, right? Um, okay, now wait, there were some questions or comments here. Um, okay, so Pakiza says that's a very interesting and is sort of that's very interesting and is sort of similar to the idea of marriage in Islam, where you're supposed to marry and have children in order to have children and increase the number of Muslims so the religion can continue. Yeah, that's you know that's a, actually a pretty widespread view about marriage. Uh, um, it's uh, you know pretty much the Jewish view about marriage traditionally, but I mean, it's pretty much, uh, I think, yeah, it's very widespread traditional view about marriage is that its purpose is to produce children and take care of them so that there'll be more of us, <laughs> whoever we are, or, or more human beings, if you think of it that way. Um, you know, um, I don't know if this necessarily means that, for example, Locke would be opposed to gay marriage or to marriage between people who aren't able to bear children in a in a civil state or even in the state of nature. I mean, I think he, in a state of nature, he would probably ask, well, what difference does it make if you say you're married, right? I mean, if it's just about this, then it's your own business. Uh, unless you're planning to adopt children, of course, then this secondary purpose could exist without the primary purpose, right? If children are abandoned in the state of nature, then it becomes everyone's responsibility to take care of them. Uh, you could imagine people making a contract with each other for that purpose. But um, anyway, in a civil state, you know, like obviously in the state of nature, your health insurance doesn't depend on whether you're married you know, there's no health insurance, <laughs> right? I mean, all those issues that we have in, a, in, in, in our complicated civil state just don't exist. In, so in that context, I'm not sure it's, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not sure it's, it's wrong or particularly bad to think that the purpose of quote unquote marriage is procreation, but, um, 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 And it's, I guess, I mean, you can put it, if you assume that procreation is important, uh, which, um, um, I mean, it's not as if people in this period have not started to worry about the possibility of there being too many people. Um, at least in a certain kingdom, if not, you know, in a certain commonwealth, if not in the whole world. Um, but for the most part, yeah, we think we want more people. That will be better. So um, if you want that, then you, you know, you do at least want people who are planning to um, have children to form a compact like this. Um, so even if it's not the only reason for it, it definitely is, it makes sense to say that it's a reason for it. Let's see. Um, so what would Locke think or say about polyamorous relationships or even relationships in which the people involved cannot procreate? Uh, yes. Yeah, so polyamorous, I mean, he actually mentions at some point as, I mean, not polyamory per se, but he mentions as a point against Filmer in one of the previous chapters, he says, well, what about places where women have more than one husband? What happens there? <laughs> so, I mean, he knows that, you know, monogamy is not the only type of 
relationship that people have set up for this purpose. I think he's talking about it in a simplified way here, but I mean, I mean, first of all, obviously, if you're talking about the Bible, the Bible is, you know, lots of important people in the Bible have more than one, lots of important men in the Bible have more than one wife. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, uh, neither Filmer nor someone responding to Filmer would want to restrict this to one man and one woman. Uh, but Locke, based on that comment, also, you know, earlier that that objection to Filmer, I think um, he would want his explanation to work for whatever other kind of arrangement there is, right? One woman and many men, many men and many women. The point is, like, whoever is going to uh, have children together, exactly how they're sorted with each other, they should not only produce children, but also have arrangements for taking care of them. Um, okay, I mean, I wanted to go into that somewhat. I don't, it's um, not, you, oh yeah, question. Yes, yeah, Samantha. Um, so you said that in the case of like adoption or I guess like when a child is like in, in the state of nature, like their parents have like abandoned them. Um, did you say the responsibility falls on everyone to make sure that child is supported or whoever to take like responsibility of them? Um, I, uh, um, I don't know a place where Locke explicitly says that, but I think it follows from everything he says about, right? I mean, he, you know, he says this is this is um, part of the difference between, well, it is and it isn't. But I mean, so you know, according to Locke, the law of nature derives from my duty of preserving myself and the human species in general. Um, now, I mean, we know from the essay that he thinks that nevertheless, like my will is always determined by my own pleasure and pain. Um, so when you say that I have a duty like that, it must ultimately be enforced by something that's going to happen to me. But, you know, but he, he seems to think it is enforced by something like that. So that, yeah, that tells me that if children are abandoned, he would say that, you know, um, whoever else is, finds themselves in a position to uh, rescue and take care of them has an obligation to do it. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, these like obligations to take care of people who need help are a little bit tricky. Like, I mean, they're probably, but not that Locke talks about this anywhere I know of, but they're probably what uh, is called an imperfect duty. Kant makes a big deal about this, right? That like, uh, but he didn't invite, invent the term, but he, Kant does make a big deal about this. That there's some, per, a perfect duty is a duty that tells you you must do exactly X, and if you don't do X, you haven't fulfilled your duty. An imperfect duty is one that tells you like you should do X, but it doesn't tell you how much of it you should do, basically, right? It's going to have to be decided by something else, by competing demands, by something like that, right? So, like, you know, um, um, but at least I think Locke would say, yeah, everyone has some obligation to try to take care of these children who have been abandoned. Um, and then, sorry, I'm just writing that down. Um, so, I guess, so, Hobbes and Locke probably have very different views on this subject because Locke is saying that naturally the power derives, like, from the man because of his, um, strength and ability, but Hobbes, uh, believes that it would naturally fall, um, to the woman because of her ability to know like who the father is and all that stuff he went over but would they both agree that 
whatever is determined in the compact that they make together determines who has that authority in the family. Yeah, but I mean, it's complicated. Like, so first of all, it is not the same thing on, for Hobbes as it is for Locke, right? Because like I said, Hobbes doesn't talk about an authority of one parent over the other parent at all, basically. I mean, not only in the state of nature, he never really explains where that comes from, I think. Um, so uh, Hobbes is only talking about authority over the children. Um, and that's why he says, well, it goes to the woman if there's no arrangement, in partly because if there's no arrangement, we have to take the woman's word for it, who the father is anyway, right? So, like, as far as we know, these are her children. But, of course, Locke is, taking, is, is talking about a case where they were, like, uh, fortunately, they both agree that these are their children. <laughs> and, they, and they both agree that they're going to take care of them together. And the only question is, but what if we, what if we don't, can't decide what to do in a particular case, who's going to cast the deciding vote? So it's really actually a different question that Hobbes is considering as opposed to Locke. And it's maybe not surprising that they reach different answers. Um, but also, uh, yeah, so according to Hobbes and Locke, it depends on what contract they actually made with each other. But again, you have to remember that according to Hobbes, in the state of nature, if you made a contract, but later you say, I don't believe the other person's going to keep the contract, you don't have to keep it either. And you're the one who decides. So, right, it's just like the thing about the limits on the sovereign. In effect, according to Hobbes, you know, compacts you've made in the state of nature just don't really bind you. Um, so it's kind of theoretical that the contract determines in the state of nature, I think, according to Hobbes. Um, uh, you know, I'm, why does he say that at all? I think, again, probably just to rule out the idea that it's somehow naturally decided how it's going to work. Right? So, um, um, So that you wouldn't say, in a case where you now have people who are in a state of nature with respect to each other and have children, like two monarchs, um, you wouldn't say, oh, they have no right to make any arrangements. The, ch the children go to the father. Ray Hobbes would co come back and say, no, they can make whatever arrangement they want. Um, um, Professor, I have a question. Yeah. Um, were Locke and Hobbes, like, in competition with each other? Or, I mean, I guess I could have figured out well, the year, but it seems like there's animosity. Yes, well, I mean, so Locke is a lot younger than Hobbes, and I don't remember the years now either. I only remember them, you know, um... So I don't remember how old Locke was when Hobbes died. I think there was some overlap, but not much, and not with the period where Locke was actually active as a writer. But I don't remember if it was... Anyway, so they're, yeah, they're not in competition with each other, like... Um, they're not, like, writing back and forth against each other, but they are on opposite sides of a lot of things. Um, and I mean, it's not, it's, it's actually kind of complicated. I mean, it's not just that Hobbes is like an extreme monarchist Tory of some kind and Locke is heavily involved in Whig anti-royalist politics, but there's also like, um, animosities between Hobbes and Locke's teachers about, um, like, uh, various unrelated issues. Hobbes claimed to have discovered a way of squaring the circle and one of Hobbes' favorite, Locke's favorite teachers, who was a mathematician, carried on a long dispute with him over many years trying to show that what he, you know, that he was wrong, which of course he was. 
and uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so there's there is a certain amount of animosity actually. I think even like personal animosity, even though like I, not like they know each other or something, but um, but uh, but you probably don't need that to explain why Locke would think it's important to refute Hobbes. Okay, gotcha. I just was curious. I feel like it's a trend in history for writers to feel some type of way about each other. Yeah, although, but there's oftentimes our, you know, our philosophers who uh, are not hostile to each other, but just disagree. So, you know, like I think Locke's attitudes to Descartes, for example, is different from his attitude towards Hobbes, even though he would like to refute both of them. Um, I think he respects Descartes and, you know, doesn't th and, and doesn't like Hobbes. Uh, but, um, but I mean, I guess you might be asking a different question, which is like, so why is it that each philosopher comes along and says the ones before them are all wrong and starts over again? Um, that's a whole complicated issue, but that, that, that does kind of happen. Um, all right. Um, so meanwhile, there's some things in the text here. Okay. So Bakiza says the reason why is polygamy is that there's more women than men. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. I, polygamy is the most common form of, uh, marriage, like anthropologically speaking, I think, but. I don't know. Anyway, um, so this type of dominion we just went over is only over the wife and not the children. Correct, because he talked about what kind of dominion there is over the children in the previous chapter, and he said it's the same for both parents. Now, I mean, obviously this arrangement between the mother and the father is going to have some effect on the children because when the mother and the father disagree, then the father is going to override the mother and therefore like the command of both parents to the children will be the father's. But, um, but like most of the time, you know, and like, I mean, I can, well, I don't know if I should apply my experience to people in the Lockean state of nature, but I'll just say that, you know, like most of the time, even if you have that privilege, the last thing you want is to start overriding the other parent. Right? You want to say, do what your mother said. And so I think like that, you know, nor I think Locke envisions that normally they would each be in charge of the children and only in exceptional circumstances would the father have to say, well, actually, you know, according to our agreement, I have the deciding vote here. Um, yeah, okay. Um, all right, there's probably, I mean, this is really interesting. I was about to say, you know, like a, this, it isn't really closely tied, I think, to other things in Locke, but it is obviously important in its own right, and also um, uh, Rousseau and uh, especially Wilson Craft are, are going to be interested in this issue. So I, you know, uh, I thought it was worth going into what Locke says about it. Um, but uh, now I should go on to discuss political society. Unless there's more questions about this. Okay. Um, political or civil society, right? Remember that um, civitas is just the Latin equivalent to polis, so political and civil should mean the same thing, although, of course, they don't always, but they should. <laughs> All right, so, um, um, so this is Locke's description or perhaps definition of what political society is. 
in section uh, 87. Um, so chapter 7 section 87 page 46 um, there and there only is political society where every one of its mem the members hath quitted this natural power. What was the natural power? It's the natural power to punish offenses. Hath quitted this natural power, resigned it up into the hands of the community in all, in all cases that exclude him not from appealing for protection to the law established by it. Wait, shouldn't there have been an and there? And? In opposition. All right. So, okay. So, um, <laughs> uh, so political society, according to Locke, is where um, each member resigns the right of punishment. to the community. Um, so what does this mean actually? Well, um, first of all, I mean, like it kind of, it looks on the surface as if it's very similar to Hobbes, right? I'm giving up my right of nature. So, of course, it's true that Hobbes wouldn't say there's a right of nature to punish um, because uh, there, when I harm someone else in the state of nature, according to Hobbes, it's not a punishment. I have the right to harm them, but I don't have the right to punish them because it's impossible to punish by definition unless there's a law. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, you know, other than that difference, you might think this is pretty similar to Hobbes. I'm giving up, uh, you know, the right I have in the state of nature to defend myself and others. Um, So, but I think it's different, and not only because that right is different, according to what right I had is different, according to Locke and Hobbes, but also because um, according to Locke, um, I had not only rights, but obligations in the state of nature. And I had obligations, um, or rather, I had rights only because I had obligations. Right? So remember the, that, that thing that Locke says in general about laws, that to be free of a certain law, you have to be someone who can be expected to observe it. So to be free of a certain law, again, means that, you know, um, you have this fear of freedom that comes from that law restricting everyone else from interfering with you. Um, they're doing that because they expect you to also follow the law, right? So they expect you to stay within this respect restricted realm and not come out of it and hurt them. So um, if there's a, a person or a animal or whatever that uh, we don't think can understand um, this situation or that we've learned by experience just won't respect it, 
um, then uh, they, they don't have this right. That's the justification of punishment, according to Locke. Right? The reason I can punish, so to punish someone means doing something to them that I normally would have no right to do. But Locke says, but because they declared themselves to be outside the law of reason by breaking it, that's what gives us the right to then um, intrude on them and punish them to whatever extent we think is necessary to get them to respect this limit again. Um, so, um, so again, you know, like I only had this right because I had an obligation to observe everyone else's right. So this means that, um, um, I can't, there's no way I can absolutely resign my right to punish because I can't resign my obligation. Right? So like forget about forget about forming a commonwealth. Suppose I just make one individual my agent to do something. And I say, you know, um, go get me some potatoes from so and so. And my agent goes off and steals the potatoes from so and so. Now, um um I can't say, um, you know what, I'm giving my obligation not to steal things from people to my agent also. <laughs> so if they steal things, it's not my problem. And then when the agent brings back the potatoes, say, oh, thank you very much, <laughs> and keep the potatoes, right? On the contrary, uh, you know, if my agent has behaved unjustly, I think, you know, I have, if anything, a stronger, I mean, I don't know if Locke says this explicitly, but you might think I have, if anything, a stronger obligation to help the person who the potatoes were stolen from get them back and help punish the, the thief. Right? So, um... The same thing goes for the Commonwealth. I can't absolutely give up my right um, to punish injustice or to prevent injustice because, or, um, um, no, sorry, I, was, I can't absolutely give up my right to to, to punish on my own uh, um, decision because I can't, I can't give up the obligation that creates it. So if I entered into a compact that cre created this commonwealth and the commonwealth, you know, then by its officials goes out and starts performing injustice on my behalf, I can't just say, well, that's their problem, right? And I, I can't punish them. I gave up my right to punish. Um, no, I still have the obligation I had in the state of nature, um, and my agent's not taking care of it, so I have to. <laughs> um, or in other words, I could put it this way, like, when I set up the Commonwealth, I'm trusting the Commonwealth to perform my obligation and to my obligation to defend me and other people against injustice. Um, I'm, I'm trusting my agent to do that, but if my agent fails and doesn't perform their trust, then the obligation will come back to me. So, um, Maybe the potatoes example wasn't the best, but I don't know. I should think of a better one. Like if you could imagine that people asked me to arbitrate between them or something, and I said, well, here's my agent who's going to do it for me. And then the agent, you know, does something really unjust. They're going to have the right to come back to me and say, hey, you know, look what your agent did. <laughs> Um, and I'm not going to be able to say, oh, I passed off that obligation to my agents. 
Um, yeah. So we take accountability for them, basically. Yeah, right. I mean, that is, we can't get rid of our accountability. Yeah. Whereas, again, according to Hobbes, I didn't have any accountability in the state of nature. <laughs> so everything you're like this, the scenario or the environment that we're currently like discussing on how you're saying, um, I have like rights and obligations and to be free of a certain law, you have to be willing to observe it. This is still in the state of nature. Well, it's in the state of nature, but of course the Commonwealth is formed in the state of nature, right? So in the state, right, that it's not until after it's formed that we're in a civil state. So we're all in the state of nature. It's, it's just like me appointing someone as my agent in the state of nature. In fact, that is what it is, right? I'm resigning up certain rights to someone else who's going to represent me. Locke okay. and Hobbes definitely I, agree I, about that. I agree with Vanessa where I'm still a little confused on um, the obligation part. So it's like, because you said according to Locke, I had rights because I had obligations. But the obligations are to the community, like are the obligations equivalent to like how when Samantha said, like, we would take care of the kid if the, if the parents just disappeared or whatever. Does that make sense? Well, there might be some, yeah, there might be some positive obligations like that. Locke doesn't discuss that very much, at least not in this book. Um, but, um, yeah, there might be some positive obligations to actually take care of other people, but I'm thinking mostly of the negative obligation I have not to interfere in their sphere of liberty. Right, not to interfere in their property, which, um, as Locke emphasizes several times here, like when he says the purpose of the Commonwealth is to preserve property, property means life, liberty, and estate, or life, liberty, and possessions. Right, so I, you know, I have an obligation in the state of nature not to unjustly interfere with other people's life, liberty, and possessions. There's nothing I can do that will free me of that obligation. So, like, if I create, if, if, if I join in creating a government and the government turns out to be unjust, um, like, I'm still required to protect people from that injustice and to punish the people who do it if I can. makes more sense. Okay. I think maybe I explained it better that time. I mean, I think also if you think back to what, you know, what it turned out, what, what really the compact turned out to be according to Hobbes was something like, I promise not to interfere with the sovereign. Wait, did, you say, did you mean Locke or Hobbes? Right now, now I'm saying Hobbes, right? So okay. according to Hobbes, the contact, comp, compact ended up being, I promise not to interfere with the sovereign's attempt to punish other people. Right. So again, according to Locke, I can't promise that. I don't have the authority to promise that. According to Hobbes, I do. Right. According to Hobbes, in the state of nature, I have the right to do whatever I want. So if I want to let A punish B, quote unquote, but completely un, uh, unjustly, in the state of you know, and I think that's to the advantage of my own self-preservation, then I can do that. And that's exactly what Hobbes thinks I do when I form. The Commonwealth, I say, well, you know, this state of war of all against all is so bad for my own self-preservation. I'm going to promise not to interfere with this sovereign does, no matter how bad. It still won't be as bad as the state of nature, right? But according to Locke, in the state of nature, I had no right to um, promise that I wouldn't defend people against injustice or punish people who perpetrate injustice. I couldn't say that. So that couldn't be the promise that formed the Commonwealth. So the promise must be limited by certain conditions. And they must be enforceable because I'm obliged to enforce them. Oh, okay, so that's where the obligation part comes in. Yeah. The obligation to enforce. Yeah, so Locke is, so the disagreement between Hobbes and Locke is not going to be that Hobbes says, 
you may never go against the government no matter what, the sovereign, no matter what. Whereas Locke says you can if you want to. It's going to be, Hobbes is going to say, you can never go against the sovereign no matter what. And Locke is going to say, in certain circumstances, you are obliged to rebel against the commonwealth. Okay, thank you so much. All right. So, I mean, of course, that doesn't mean, and we'll see more about this next time, it doesn't mean that Locke thinks that you should start a rebellion every time you disagree with anything the government does. You have to weigh the consequences, you know, and decide if it's, if it's worth it, you know, um, and usually it won't be. But, you know, uh, but, but that um, obligation and therefore that right is always held in reserve, according to Locke. There's always something that the Commonwealth could do that would oblige the subjects to rebel. Um, so, um, okay, so that's one limitation on this resigning of my right. Uh, but there's another... Um, limitation. So this, this limitation is like, I can't resign it absolutely. Right? That would be, again, that would be promising more than I have the right to promise. I can't resign it absolutely. But the second limitation is that I shouldn't resign it. to any private will. Now, I mean, here, Locke is going to have to agree I could do that, right? And in fact, I didn't assign the part, the long part of chapter 8 where he talks about how, like, what really happened at the origins of political societies, you know, based on... Uh, history, myth, and guesswork, <laughs> but uh, but you know, um, but yeah, Locke thinks that probably when people first started political societies, they didn't think too carefully about this, and they were just like, okay, so we need someone who's going to take over everyone's power of of punishing, and like. Um, and maintain order among us, and they probably just thought, okay, let's have so and so do it. We trust him or her. Uh, um, he says it was often the father, he doesn't say, but I guess he would predict that even if it's more often the father, that it could often be the mother. Uh, but in any case, or it could just be anyone that everyone in the community, oh, sorry, shouldn't resign it to any private will. Uh, I'm sorry. I, you know, I know what to do to improve my my whiteboard writing. But I just can't do it. Shouldn't resign it to any private will. So again, so like, so Locke thinks at the beginning of political societies, probably people did do this often. They just said. Um, they just said, who will be the representative? So-and-so. <laughs> That's what they all agreed. And then so-and-so would decide who to punish for what. And, you know, if so-and-so was trustworthy, and these are people who all know each other and whatever, and it's a small society, then maybe that worked pretty well. Um, but, you sh but it's not a good idea. <laughs> You shouldn't resign your right to punish to any private will because, you know, um, chances are in the long run that's going to work out very poorly. You're basically, you know, um, you're basically setting that person to, up to act like the sovereign acts according to Hobbes and Locke says, not only is that not an improvement in the state of nature, that's actually worse than the state of nature, because this person is unrestrained by any law, 
and they have all this extra power and the flatterers are going to tell them, and he's probably thinking of Filmer and Hobbes, <laughs> right? Flatterers are going to tell them, are going to give them justifications for why they shouldn't have to obey any laws and whatever. Um, so, uh, so you're basically creating someone really dangerous if you do that. And he also shows that Hooker agrees with him about this. <laughs> So, um, but wait, you know, what alternative is there? I mean, how can a will not be private? How can the will not be the, the will either of some individual or of some assembly of individuals, which is still private? Um, even if it's the will of everyone deciding by majority, it's still, you know, compared to me, is it's it's another person who has their own interests that are not mine, and can be flattered or misled or whatever into thinking that they have absolute power to do whatever they want. When someone said the private prison industry would disagree. Uh, okay, but private in that sense, that's a little bit different. Maybe that's a joke. I don't know, <laughs> but um, it's, uh, I mean, like in an absolute monarchy, there are public prisons. They're not, a, it's not a private prison industry. They're run by the monarch, but it's still, if it's an absolute monarchy, it's, it's still private in this sense, right? It's some individual's will that is behind the, ultimately behind the decision who goes in prison and who doesn't, right? Whereas what we call a private prison industry is actually not that, which is not to say I think it's, that's a good idea, but it's, right, I mean, it's, it's still a public decision who, go, who goes to prison, it's, right? So, yeah. Um, Okay, um, but anyway, so getting back to this, like, what would the um, alternative be? So, I mean, I think Hobbes thinks there is no alternative, right? So Hobbes says, look, someone's going to have to decide. Um, uh, you can't just say, uh, you know, everyone's going to be under the law equally because... You know, uh, um, if you disagree about what should be the law, who's going to decide? Some private individual or assembly will have to be given the power. And again, from this point of view, we're looking at even possibly the entire assembly of the people as a private will. So... Um, So the answer in Locke, it's less explicit in Locke, but I'm pretty sure it's Locke's answer, and it's more explicit in Rousseau and Kant and Hegel, is that um, a public or general will is not different from a private or individual will because of the subject of the will, because of like how many people are willing or whatever. It's different by the object of the will. A public or general will can only will universal laws, can only will, can only will general rules. It can't rule anything about, will anything about specific cases. That's the limitation. Right? So in Kant, this turns into the categorical imperative. Um, that is thinking about, I guess you might say, the law of nature as the public will of everyone. But, um, um, but in Rousseau and Locke, it's about how to set up, right? That's what Kant calls the kingdom of ends. But in Rousseau and Locke, it's about setting up an actual commonwealth on earth. <laughs> um, and, uh, so, um, yeah, just going back in the same section here. 
um, that I was just reading before, section 87. Oops. And thus all private judgment of every particular member being excluded, the community comes to be umpire by settled standing rules, indifferent and the same to all parties. That's the difference between a public will and a private will. So in other words, um, I shouldn't resign my power to punish to anyone who's going to be able to punish according to decree on the spot. I should only resign it to someone or some people or some structure of different people because, um, as we'll see, Locke, unlike Hobbes, has plenty of room for mixed forms of government. Um, but anyway, like I should only resign it to some structure that is going to make general rules that apply to everyone, no matter who they are. Um, so, I mean, um, In a sense, I think Hobbes would agree with this in, in, in so far as he would say, well, two things. First of all, he would say that when the king makes a law, like by definition, a, a law is a general rule that applies to everyone. But actually, no, he didn't say that, right? No, he said, actually, he doesn't say that. He says a law could be a law just to one individual. That's what's known as... Um, Privilege, right? This is a privilege is a term out of um, Roman legal terminology. It means a private law. A privilege was when the emperor or the senate or whatever made a special law just for you that didn't apply to everyone else. Um, so. Um, Hobbes says, yeah, the sovereign can do that. But moreover, Hobbes says that, I guess, I mean, Hobbes would agree that a law has to be standing. It has to be announced in advance, for example, right? It can't be just an on-the-spot arbitrary decision. But that's just in order to count as a law. Does the sovereign have the right to also make arbitrary on-the-spot decisions? Yes, <laughs> according to Hobbes. Um, right, so um, um, so this actually is a really different position about what authority you're giving up to the commonwealth. You're only giving up the authority to make laws that apply to people in general. Now, I mean, that doesn't mean that the law can't somehow distinguish between different types of people. Um, I mean, uh, it will have to sometimes, uh, um, um, and I think Locke thinks it will tend to in serious ways, right? Like most societies he knows about have distinctions between nobles and commoners, for example. Those are created by the positive law. Um, but um, but the question is how it can make those distinctions. So, and Locke's answer is the law can't say X, Y, and Z are going to be nobles and everyone else is going to be commoners. It will have to establish some qualifications or procedure or something by which that's going to be decided that will then apply indifferently to everyone. Um, you know, and I mean, that's kind of an extreme case, but there's lots of milder cases, you know, if the law says like, you know, I don't know what, there's different rules for, 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 for professional fishermen than amateur fishermen or what, you know, right? Like laws, 
are always going to make distinctions like that. Uh, but they, what it can't say is, you know, the law for all fishermen is X, except for, you know, Joe Schmo, and the law for Joe Schmo is Y. Um, this is actually something that was included in the, is this in the original Constitution or in the Bill of Rights? I don't remember. The thing about, I think it's in the original Constitution about Congress not being able to pass bills of attainder. Well, maybe it's in the Bill of Rights. Anyway, it's the same thing, right? The Parliament in England did take themselves to have the right to make these kind of laws that mention someone specifically, um, but uh, the framers of the U.S. Constitution wanted to make it clear that the Congress would not have that right. Um, so, you know, of course, there's still room for corruption here, as there always is, but at least, um, you know, uh, right, that they can, like, like, you know, cunningly define some class of people such that it only contains one. I think there's things in our tax code like that right now. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, at least uh, it's clear that they shouldn't be doing that, uh, according to Locke. That is, or I guess I should say, you shouldn't set up a form of government that can do that. So this is why, this restriction is why, in general, in a, at least in a, in a commonwealth that's well set up, according to Locke, there's going to be a distinction between the legislative and the executive. Right? And he's thinking, of course, when he thinks about legislative versus ex executive, he's thinking about parliament versus king. Um, so when they wrote our constitution, they had to figure out what to do to do this without having a king. <laughs> but in any case, um, but the, uh, um, this says legislative. I can't even find the pieces of letters myself. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, because the, the power of the Commonwealth to exercise dominion, to make rules that are obligatory to people, is only this power to make universal rules or general rules that will apply to everyone in general. But of course, when it comes to enforcing them, someone is going to have to um, enforce them specifically against the people who violated them, right? So that's not going to be by universal rules. So these are actually very different functions. And Locke says that even though in principle they could be done by the same person or the same body, that would in effect be doing what he says you shouldn't do, right? So that when people have tried that, they found it's inconvenient. And that's, uh, also, he also quotes Hooker to that effect, right? So because these are, these are very different functions, that in general, the right, right way to do it is that the legislative will make the laws, a public will will make the laws, that is a will that can only make general rules, but then a private will acting as agent of the legislative will enforce the laws. So, um, um, so he doesn't, I mean, this obviously is a version of the distinction between legislative and executive that we still that we make now. It's not exactly the same. They're not co-equal branches, right? The legislative is supreme, and the executive is acting as its agent. Actually, um, and the um, the. Um, Judicature, I think, is considered to be part of the executive. 
right? So that's also being for, performed by agents of the legislative power. Um, this is, I mean, this is in line with the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty as it was eventually adopted in England that, you know, it, it's not true in England that there's the executive. Well, of, I mean, it, the, the actual executive that is the queen is, doesn't really do anything. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that is the legal executive. So who really fulfills the executive uh, function? Well, it's the prime minister, but the, the prime minister, the prime minister is technically the queen's minister, but uh, the parliament has the right to um, vote the prime minister out. So the queen can only appoint someone who has majority support in parliament. So in effect, the executive is whoever parliament wants it to be. Um, we have a system that, uh, as we just noticed, is not perfect. <laughs> But we try to, right, we're doing the best we can to make these things actually independent so they're not responsible to each other. Um, uh, okay. Um, so I think in part because of this, because he doesn't think that clear, he doesn't, First of all, doesn't think that the legislative and executive must be different. He thinks they could, in principle, be the same. And also, he thinks of the executive as kind of acting on behalf of the legislative. He doesn't notice a big problem with this. I think he just doesn't notice it, but which turns out to be really important in Rousseau, which is how, if, how can the legislative appoint the executive to begin with? Right? That is, some individual has to be appointed, or assembly of individuals have to be appointed to this role. But the legislative can only make general rules, so how are they going to do it? So uh, Locke doesn't really um, focus on that problem. It seems like at one time the legislative is going to have to make a law that refers to an individual, at least once. Um, so... Um, um, right. Is there anything more I want to say? I mean, we'll see more about the division between the legislative and the executive and what other powers there are next time. Are there questions about this? Obviously, this is a very different view about what the king is than Hobbes or Filmer, right? saying that, you know, uh, the king is there to enforce the laws made by parliament. It's historically, in terms of the history of the English constitution, would be a very, very difficult thesis to <laughs> uh, defend. <laughs> uh, but... Um, It's actually partly, I guess, where the term Whig historian comes from. The Whigs were notorious for like distorting the history of England to make it seem like it was all pointing towards their political ideology. Um, uh, but any, anyway, in theory, you can understand how he thinks the English Constitution is supposed to work. Okay. Um, so our obligation um, comes from the fact that the law of nature is binding in the state of nature that we have no other option but to adhere to it our oblig obligation to the law of nature or to the civil law um sorry just before like um like the right that we have to punish comes from the fact that we have rights at all like it's the point you made a while ago oh that yeah wait so what was our obligation I'm, comes from our obligation what? 
I was saying that our right to be protected by the law of nature comes from our obligation to obey the law of nature. Okay. Maybe that would be a simple way to put it. Um, and Locke says the same is true of the civil law. Right? Remember, that's his explanation why, according to the civil, the civil law also, um, will not treat children uh, as having their own wills, but will require them to be represented by an adult. Because um, it's, I mean, it's actually, it's for the protection of the children. If the children were allowed to do whatever they wanted to, then they would have to be treated like dangerous animals, right? That, that is, they would be creatures that can't be expected to obey the civil law. Um, so they wouldn't be protected by it. There's no punishment in the state of nature. No, no, there is according to Locke, not according to Hobbes, but according, no, this is important. According to Locke, there is punishment in the state of nature because according to Locke, there is a law in the state of nature, a law that binds in foro externo, namely the law of nature. There is punishment, um, but, it's, but everyone has the right to inflict it in the state of nature, according to Locke. According to Hobbes, there's no punishment in the state of nature because there's no law. So whatever harm you inflict just doesn't count as punishment. Um, right? That is, punishment is impossible in the state of nature, according to Hobbes, because there's no law. In it. There's no law that binds it for our external. Right. Um, okay. So... Um, so the main thing from today's reading that I haven't discussed yet is, well, actually, there's two main things. I wonder if I get to them both. Um, there's, I, there's two things I still want to definitely talk about if I can. One is how political society begins. This is actually not that complicated, so maybe I can get to it quickly. And then the other is territory, which is very confusing to me, at least. How commonwealths come to be places instead of contracts. <sighs> That's this fuzzy board again. Um, So, um, um, and as we'll see, this question of territory is connected with a, a difficult and kind of famous issue in Locke, the question of tacit consent, um, how people can be subject to a commonwealth by tacit consent. So, but let me talk about the first one first. Um, it's pretty simple, but I just want to point out, I, I think this is true in Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau. I don't know if Wollstonecraft will address, addresses it or not. I don't think she does, but, um, but there's two steps in the formation of political society. The first step is um, um, deciding to be a commonwealth. And then the second step is choosing, I guess I'll say, the government. That is, choosing the form of government, although also, of course, you're going to have to choose who will first fill certain offices. Um, so, um, or at least set up the procedure for doing that. 
but um, but it's basically choosing the form of government. Right, so the first step, according to both Locke and Hobbes, happens has requires unanimity. Everyone who's going to be part of a commonwealth agrees, okay, we're all going to be a commonwealth together. Anyone who wasn't part of that unanimous decision isn't going to be part of the commonwealth that's coming to exist. Or according to Hobbes, they might, but only if it's by acquisition, right? That is... Um, according to Hobbes, like if five of us to get together and decide we're going to form a commonwealth and then we say, hey, let's force this sixth person in, then for us it's a commonwealth by institution, but by them, for them it's by acquisition. But according to Locke, we don't have the authority to do that, so forget about that. This is everyone together has to consent to be part of a commonwealth. What do they consent to? Well... Um, they consent to take this step by majority vote. That's what Locke says. This is their, um, yeah, like, so if you look in chapter 8, section 95, Ooh, I'm almost out of time. I'm not going to get to talk about this. You know what? Let me just leave it at that and so, just so I can say a few things about this and maybe I can finish next time. But, um, right, so this is unanimous. Or no, maybe I should just leave all of this for next time. This, this part has to be unanimous. This part is by majority. Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau all agree about both of those things. Namely, that the first step has to be unanimous. The first step is agreeing to become a community. Agreeing to become a community, says Locke, um, I mean, he gives, I think, maybe a more detailed justification of this than Hobbes does. Agreeing to become a community means agreeing to do what the majority decide. Because otherwise, uh, um, as he puts it, it would be like Cato entering the theater only to leave again. I guess there's a story that Cato was not in favor of going to the theater and he only went in in order to leave again. This would be Cato, Cato the Younger, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, um, so, uh, right, he says, you know, if, if, if we enter into agreement to form a commonwealth and the way it's going to work is we won't do anything unless everyone agrees, then we won't do anything. <laughs> Because it's unlikely that everyone's going to agree, or even that everyone can make the meeting. <laughs> so, uh, right, he says if it's a large enough number of people, there's sure, it's for sure some people will have business or illness or whatever that calls them elsewhere, and you won't even have everyone there. So you have to make another arrangement, and he says uh, he actually... I think Hobbes and Rousseau disagree with this, actually. Locke says, if you want, you can make a special arrangement at this step. If everyone agrees that instead of by majority, it's going to be two-thirds majority or something, you can do that. But in the absence of an explicit condition, it's going to be the majority that decides. Because that's how a group of people can decide together in such a way that there will be a decision. I mean, of course, unless there's an even number of people and they happens to be exactly tied. But if you have enough people, that probably won't happen. So, um, um, wait, what else did I want to say about that? Oh, uh, I don't know if I did want to say any more about that, but luckily... Uh, um, 
That's lucky because I don't have time to say more about it. So I, I, I think I will have to talk about this next time, even though there's a lot of other important things next time, but this is super important. And like I said, confusing. Locke doesn't, Hobbes, I think, doesn't address this at all. And Locke doesn't give a very good explanation of why it is that commonwealths have territory. Okay, anyway, I guess I will talk about that on Tuesday. Bye, everyone.